Welcome to another message from Bridge Assembly, located at 725 Granite Avenue in Helena, Montana. For more information on Bridge, go to our website at bridgehelena.com. It is our prayer that this message will help you to connect with God, connect with others, and connect others with God. You were evoked before everything, and you will be. You will be forever. Lord God, you are in charge of everything. God, you created everything. And even throughout all of that, you've chosen to love each one of us. Lord, that is so hard to understand so, so much of the time. That you hold all power, you hold all authority. You hold all love, you hold all hope. Put your hands big enough to hold each one of us. So Father, thank you today. We lift you up. We are so grateful for so many things. And, and Lord... Though the world will try to distract us and bog us down and divert us, Lord, we choose to make a stand within your presence. Jesus, everything has been accomplished because of you. There's, there's nothing that keeps us from the Father anymore because of you. So, Lord God, we, we lay our lives down to you. And we enjoy that. We enjoy our time with you. We, we enjoy our salvation. We enjoy that you are Lord over our lives. Lord God, we enjoy these things. It's not a burden. Your yoke is not a burden. So Lord God, in our thankfulness, be glorified. Lord God, in our words, be glorified. Lord God, in our actions, be glorified. Today, as we really begin to enter into a season, the season of Christmas and, and what the world is trying to, to change that to, Lord God, we know the truth. So, Lord God, in our circles of influence, in our jobs, in our families even, let this be a season of giving the gift of our testimony. Because, Lord God, we have too many people in our life that are apart from you. And nobody knows what tomorrow holds. So let's grab hold of every opportunity. Every time we say Merry Christmas, let's, let's say that with the anticipation that there'll be a further conversation into why we choose to celebrate our Savior's birth. That starts now. But let that, that not end on December 26th. Help us to live a life that we cannot not talk about you. Jesus, today we love you. We lift you up. We glorify you. We worship you. And we pray this in your mighty name. The name of Jesus. And everybody shout it out. Amen. You guys can be seated. How many of you guys in here this morning have a Thanksgiving hangover? Oh, oh, I don't want any more stuffing. I don't want any more turkey until a, you know an hour from now, and then then we'll be we'll be good to go. Hey, before we dismiss the kids, I I learned that that somebody has a, a gigantic birthday tomorrow. Who is that? Is there somebody in here who's Who's turning double digits? It's 10. The big 1-0 is coming tomorrow for Audrey. And she's just sank down in her seat. But let's make sure today during the potluck everything, wish that little girl a happy birthday. God's got lots in store for her. It's a good time, right? Your dad put me up to this. So don't be mad at your pastor. Be mad at your dad. No, it'll be great. So kids, with that, you guys can be dismissed. Go have some fun. All right. Pitter-patter. We have, 
it's a great morning. Though we have a lot of people that are out doing their Thanksgiving stuff still, um, traveling back today probably all over the place, family in town, even though we got Logan and Bailey back this morning. But not just them. There's no longer two of them. Now there's three of them. So, yay. So little Mason is here this morning, first time at church here. It's just an awesome thing. So, so love on them this, this morning and, and the, during the potluck. Don't mob them. Don't want to hold the baby. That's always just let them be. But just tell them you're praying for their, their family now. They're no longer just a couple now. They're a family. And then if you didn't notice, we have some special people back here this morning as well. Three of them, all the way from India. Stephen and Danny and Judah are here, and they'll be here, what you think, probably for about a month, doing visa stuff. I told them, when he said, we're having visa problems, I said, you should have just went with the Discover card. It, it's so much better, but um, yeah. But no, we need, to, we need to love on them extra, you know, before we send them back again. Um, but take today and just uh, love on them. And, and of course, it's, it's nice because it feels like a lot of our family is here today, even though a lot of it is still gone. It's going to be a great, great potluck today, which is today. So last Sunday's um, great time. Please stay if you're newer here, if you didn't bring anything, if you're visiting today, don't worry about it. We always have enough food. We've got lots of turkey and stuffing and mashed potatoes. No, I don't know what we have down there, but it's, it's always going to be good. So please stay for that. Um, West of 50s is having their Christmas celebration. That'll be December 10th, and that is going to be directly after service. So on December 10th, if you're 50 or over, just plan on staying and, and uh, bring your favorite snack foods or Chris. Everybody has like a Christmas food, right? Maybe. Chex Mix. Chex Mix is always a good one. But, but just bring something to share and it'll be a good time. And then um, today is actually going to be our last, last Sunday for at least a month and maybe two. So there'll be no last Sundays in January. And February might be a little touch and go. We're going to plan on February. And why I'm saying this is because we had a very generous and very large donation, monetary donation, um, to redo the kitchen downstairs. And if you, if, you know, we've been here for, for seven years, and, and uh, it's just normal church things, but we've done a lot of different things. Remember when we got here, the, the carpet in here was green. Remember that green carpet? And the stage was green and had those platforms and stuff, and, and uh, the, the projector was shining on a semi-white wall over here. And so we've done a lot in the sanctuary, right? We've just updated and things. We redid our sound, our video, um, all of those things. Um, we redid the, the, the downstairs. We put in a new floor. We painted the walls. Um, we've done all that. We've painted the outsides in and out. And, and uh, we, of course, have our coffee place now. And, and really, the last thing that really desperately needed to be done was that kitchen. It's like you walk into the church and it's like, wow, there's all sorts of great stuff. And then you kind of go down to the kitchen. And it's like, that's not art. That's spaghetti sauce on the ceiling and, and stuff like that. And the ceiling itself, it's like I go down there and, and I look up and think, man, I hope nothing falls into the food. Just because it's the old ceiling, right? So what we're going to do is... is um, through this donation and everything, we are going to gut the kitchen. We're just going to rip everything out. Um, and then there'll be new everything. There'll be new cabinets. There'll be new countertops. Um, we're going to expand a doorway. We're going to rearrange, not really rearrange. We're just going to adapt a couple things. And then that, that room next to the kitchen where the air hockey 
and stuff is it really doesn't get used is almost going to be a prep area and a pantry and all that. It's going to be really great when we get it done. Um, but that's why we won't have less Sundays next month in, uh, well, we won't have it in December, which is next month technically, because it's still, yeah, nothing in December. Um, because on the 14th and 15th of this of December, we need people to come in and help take stuff out. I don't want to say demo, because you people watch those uh, those reality shows and they show demoing, and everybody's got sledgehammers in there. We're not going to do that. We're going to actually remove stuff in a timely and orderly manner, right, Ron? Sure. And we're going to have a giant dumpster out there. And and the ladies, before the 14th and 15th, they're going to go through and unload the kitchen. And we're probably going to get rid of some of the stuff. It already happened. No. No, it all has to come out. So, So over the process of probably the next six to eight weeks, a lot of things are going to change down there. But, but people, I don't want to just say guys, anybody who would like to help um, demo the, the, the old kitchen, um, 14th and 15th of December, starting at 11. Um, Ron's kind of heading this up. He's, uh, he's our board member that's in charge of... of the building side of things. So with his background, he's, man, he's done so much already. The cabinets have already been ordered. So, you know, we don't have to get to that point, order them and then wait two months for them to get here. So everything's already done on that end, but it's, it's going to be a great thing. So please, please, if you have time to uh, either help Sandy go through the kitchen um, yeah, there's just lots of stuff in there. Um, or to actually come and help remove things, carry them out. New sinks. We're going to get new sinks. And a garbage disposal. So, so Charlie will have somewhere to put stuff. in. The, it's going to be great. So please consider doing that. Um, I think that's all the announcements. Just a heads up because Christmas Eve is actually on a Sunday. We're going to do a Sunday morning Christmas Eve service and then, and then not come back and we're not going to do a Sunday evening Christmas Eve service, if that makes sense. That's just something to get on your calendar. Um, but it seems like December we've kind of slowed down in, in stuff we're doing. We've been like, we've been going all summer, man, September, October, November, it's all been busy and now we're just going to kind of relax and demo a kitchen. So that'll be, that'll be, it's going to have a whole new ceiling with LED lights. I mean, I'm so excited. It's going to be awesome. All right, giving. We've got four ways to give, of course, like always, give online at Bridge Helena. You can also get to that through our app, which is a great thing to have. You can text, you can use our giving boxes, or you can mail it here. It's all good things. But um, man, we're just rejoicing that, that God is... God is just awesome, right? When we're faithful, and we can talk about being faithful as an individual, but we also talk about being faithful as a a body, as a congregation. And and we're faithful in so many different things. We're we're faithful in in worship. We're faithful in prayer. We're faithful in giving. We're faithful in all those things. And I do believe God blesses that. Oh, one last thing. We had our dessert auction, and I don't have my phone. How much did we wind up bringing in? for a dessert auction. Um, So that'll be going to the the Hope Center. Not Hope House, the Hope Center. Um, And that's awesome. And, And we as a church, as a board, have decided to also support them on a monthly basis. Them specifically, not the organization, but that specific one in, in Clancy. So good job, everybody. Um, and I'm sure you enjoyed your desserts. At least I hope so. Amen. All right. Let's get started because we're to a point in Scripture again that is really interesting and very insightful, but, but yeah, it's just good for us. It was good for them back then. It's also good for us today. So let's pray. Father, oh, 
You're doing so many great things. You're doing so many great things all over the place. But you're also doing so many great things in each one of us. And, and it's all because of your son, Jesus, and that, that um, relationship that you guys have and that desire to, to reconnect with your people when the, the awful sin separation occurred and continues to occur. But Lord God, we can come to you because of your son and, and have that reconnection. And that's just, that's glorious. That's what, what more can we be thankful for? That's, that's the best thing. That's the greatest thing. That's the number one thing. Jesus, yeah, man, that sacrifice, that willingness to come to this earth, to be born by a, a human woman to be born through your creation. What you spoke into effect, you came by that route. And, and that's amazing. And to, to grow up as a, as a baby, and then an infant, and then a toddler, and then a child, to a young man, and then into the greatest teacher the world had ever known. All the while knowing that you were going to take the sins of this world upon you to die for us, to bleed, to be beaten, so that we could have reconnection. Jesus, there's no words to express what that means to each one of us. There's no way to, to thank you except to say, be my Lord. I lay my life down. Use it as you deem fit. And Holy Spirit, you are the gift that keeps on giving. You're with us daily. You live within us. You guide us. You, you strengthen us. You teach us. You give us wisdom. You give us discernment. You bring on the, the, the beautiful and loving conviction that causes us to not stay where we were, but to run to you. So Holy Spirit, Jesus, Father, be glorified in this service today. Holy Spirit, allow me to speak what you would have me to speak today. Help me to articulate it. Help us to receive it, to hear it, to bring it into our brain, to process it. Let it affect our heart, but, but let it transform into actions. If it's not of that, Lord God, if it's not of you, Holy Spirit, just shut my mouth. And once again, I'm going to pray that nobody leaves here this morning the same way that they came in. Something has got to give. Something has got to change. Even if we think we're in the best place, Lord God, you have something more for us. We pray this in your name, Jesus. And everyone shout it out. Amen. Amen. How, many, how many of you guys were here last week, last Sunday for the message? Well, you guys understand that by many standards last week's text and also the the message was one that can and and really does cause controversy and strife among people hopefully it didn't cause controversy and strife within households after that message now the major determining factor as to how one receives any scripture it's any scripture and, and really any Sunday morning message or, or really any discussion or, or debate is perspective. It's where is your perspective from? What is your perspective based in? And I'm glad to say that really based upon the feedback that I received from part 23 of our series, it was pretty well accepted. I, I was thinking, you know, I, I probably got more positive feedback from last week's message than I can remember. And though it was a, a controversial, somewhat hard message, people accepted it. Why? Well, because if you are here on a Sunday morning, chances are you desire a biblical perspective. A perspective that conveys the order, the hope, and really the love of God which reminds us and really reinforces us what we learned earlier in chapter 3. Um, chap chapter 3, 2. Can you flip that slide? There it is. Set your mind and keep focused habitually on the things above, the heavenly things, not on the things that are on earth which have only temporal value, right? We're supposed to focus. There's so many things we focus on. And they really don't matter in the big 
big scheme of things, right? We're focused on the, oh, can't burn the turkey. We can't dry it out. We got to make sure we put sugar in the pumpkin pie and, and all of those things. And we focus on these things, but they don't have any eternal value. So we need to always just pull back and keep focused habitually on the things that are above. But we also acknowledge that we have a lot of work to do here. Not necessarily or only within the walls of of this church, but within our community. We need to introduce as many people as we can to Jesus, the only one who can truly change our perspective to a perspective of the Father. And that's what our perspective should be, that of the Father. It's God's perspective. When we adopt God's perspective, everything changes. I'm telling you how you look at things, relationships, jobs, whatever it is, circumstances, even trials and tribulations change when we have the perspective of the Father. So thank you for making the choice to attend really a biblical, Holy Spirit-led, Jesus-loving church. It's important. You guys are the church and we work together and we have to understand that we have to be together. Now today is really just a continuation of last week. If you're reading forward, if you're keeping up on things, you know that that uh, really today is just that continuation that we didn't have time to get to last week. And though we will be looking at some scripture that, that may not be specifically relatable The principles that we're going to look at today are always helpful. Before we get started, let's remember why Paul is writing this. He's writing this letter to the the church in, in, in Colossae because he wants to make the point, he wants to reinforce the point that Jesus is central and supreme to all and in all things, that Jesus is the Son of God and we are to strive to live a life in Christ. That's why he's writing it, but what do we take from that? How do we apply that into our life? Well, we, we come to the belief, the understanding, and the speaking out in our prayer life by saying, Jesus, you are central and supreme to me and in all things in my life. Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. Jesus, I will constantly and continually strive to live a life in you as my Lord, as well as my Savior. All right, let's just jump right into Scripture here. In your Bibles, please turn with me to Colossians chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 22. Colossians 3, 22, it says this, Servants! In everything, obey those who are your masters on earth, not only with external service as those who merely please people, but with sincerity of heart because of your fear of the Lord. Verse 22 starts a portion of Paul's letter that that addresses slaves and masters. Something that doesn't exist, at least not not legally in our society today. We know that there is human trafficking and and that type of thing. Um, Legally, by a legal standard, and and in most places in our our world today, um, slavery is no longer legal, though it, it can exist. However, in the ancient world and within the the region of of Colossae, slavery was universally accepted and also considered a, a fundamental institution. It was looked upon necessary for a civilized society. So back then, they just saw stuff different. It was the culture. Slavery was just accepted. It's just what it was, right? In fact, more than half of the people in the great cities of the Roman world were slaved. Well over half were slaves. So if you walk down the street um, in one of those ancient Roman cities, you got more than half the people were slaves to a master, slaves to somebody else. Now understand that slaves had no rights and mainly existed for the comfort, the convenience, and the pleasure of their owners. And slaves came in all different different 
flavors, I guess. Um, a lot of times we think about like slavery, we think, oh, they're out shoveling rocks and things like that. They're, they're um, doing the agricultural part of things. And, and slavery very much encompasses that. But did you know that many of the teachers and even the doctors of that time were actually slaves? So slavery was just, again, it was a part of the culture. Now this morning, we could definitely go into why one human owning another as property is fundamentally wrong, but that would be another message for another day. What we need to understand is at this point in time that Paul was writing this letter, slavery was a part. It was a major part of their society. Here's something else that we definitely need to understand. We need to understand that Paul, as well as all the other apostles, first and foremost, were evangelists of the gospel. They were not social justice warriors who demanded reform, but rather understood the very important principle that every person that comes to Jesus has the potential to change society because their perspective is now one focused upon Jesus and his teachings. Isn't that what missions is all about? We get excited. We were so excited when we got to send Stephen and Danny to India. We're so excited that they're back here this morning. But that's what missions is all about. Miss, missions is, is this evangelistic approach to spread the knowledge of Jesus so that those people can make a decision to either reject or accept Jesus. But it's, it's getting Jesus out there. That is what missions is all about. See, a missionary does not go to a, to a country or a region with the intent to politically change that environment, but rather to win souls to the kingdom, which in turn may or may not change the, the, the temporal government but it absolutely changes the eternal destination of everyone that is impacted. That's what Paul was all about. And I think the American church could learn a lot from this idea because we have tied our Christianity so closely to our political views that sometimes I think we can lose sight of that simple concept that it's about souls. It's about building the kingdom. It's not about, does my guy get elected or not, right? So Paul was here, and he's writing this, and he knew he needed to address this relationship between masters and slaves after what he had just addressed with husbands and wives and, and fathers and children. And he comes to this, and, and honestly, what we found controversial maybe last week, they would have really found controversial what we're going to talk about this week. So let's get back to our text. Paul, in his wisdom, had decided to address both, both the slaves as well as their masters. Again, something that would be, be quite edgy, because in that society, the slaves had no rights. The masters were, well, masters over all, right? So to address the slaves in such a way, but then to go on to address the masters in such a way, whoo, Paul was really walking, walking a dangerous path here. But how Paul chooses to do it is just one more example of the Holy Spirit's influence and inspiration in this letter. Paul deals with the duty of slaves in the context of the family because slaves were considered a part of the household. So this actually just flows from last week's text. Now remember from last week, we learned that the, 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 the portion of this text that we're in is dealing with duties and not rights. That's a big deal. I can't emphasize that enough. It's dealing with our duties, not our rights. Duties are something that we surrender to, right? Rights are something that we demand. 
So fundamentally, every human being has the right to be free. Fundamentally, I believe that that's just a fundamental right for every human being on this planet to be free. However, our duty to Christ as a believer cannot be dependent upon our fundamental rights, but rather a desire to live within Christ and to please God. And that's one of those things, oh, I got the right to be free because I live in America. I live in Montana, America. I have the right to be free. I can do whatever I want because it's my right to be free, to do what I desire. And yet, we can quickly forget our duty to Christ. And that's very different. And we shouldn't always tie those things together. In addressing servants, Paul says, in everything obey those who are your masters on earth, not only with external service as those who merely please people, but with sincerity of heart because of your fear of the Lord. Now, since Paul's letter here is to the faithful believers in the church, this letter would have really only been read in those Christian circles. So as radical as it may seem, we understand that this was a specific letter to a specific church to... Can't do a third one. To certain Christian followers that were, were deeply into their faith in, in Jesus. So it was within those circles. Um, and then... Because of that, it would pertain to the Christian households. Not all the households, but the Christian households. So what we have to understand is that when Paul is writing this, he is not saying that a, to a slave that, that you are to do anything contrary to the principles of the gospel. Right, He's saying within the Christian household of a Christian master and a Christian slave, here are some things that should pertain if that Christian master, or if that master was not a Christian, the slave was not to, to do things that run contrary to who Jesus is and the gospel message. Remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Remember that? Or as VeggieTales says, Rack, Shack, and Benny? Right? They were in a position and they were to do something that ran contrary to their belief in God. And they said, you know what? We may be slaves here. We may be prisoners here. We may be whatever you label us here. But that goes outside of the boundaries that God has laid out in our life. So we have to understand that's what was going on here. And um, it can be compared to both of the prior duties that, that Paul bestows upon wives and children here, right? So we have wives, we have children, and now we're talking about slaves, and there's this, really this voluntary submission, right? We talked about that last week. To live within God's order and to align one's heart to be pleasing to God, there is an obligation to submit and obey, all within the outpouring of God's love, right? That's important to understand. We look at submission because we live in a free country. We look at submission as something that leaves a bad taste in our mouth. Montana people are so independent. Oh my goodness, they're so independent. So anything that deals with submission, all right, submission, don't tread on me, right? Those type of things. But, but within God's love, we are called to submit to certain things, to certain authorities in our lives because it's God's order. Now let me ask you this. Imagine for a moment. Could, could, you, could you actually imagine the potential effect that this could have on the community? This principle that, that these, these slaves, they're submitting to their masters in such a way, they're going to do the best job that they can. They're going to take pride in their work. They're going to do it with joy. They're going to do it outpouring in love. Can you imagine the potential effect this could have on that community way back then? The slaves in obedience to their masters and, and really displaying the joy of the Lord. Others 
others in this community, other masters, other slaves, they, they, they must have been, been looking at these slaves and, 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 and asking, what's going on here? What is happening here? Why are my slaves not like his slaves? And the slaves would be going, why is my master not like, like his master? What is going on here? Why is everything so different in this household? And it reminds me of a, of a conversation that I was having with Levi a couple weeks ago. And he's working at, at Grateful Bread, right? It's down like on Rodney Street in that area. If you've ever been to, into Grateful Bread, it's like, it's like hippie. Woo, hippied out, man. It's, it, man, they make some great bread. Um, and coffee and sandwiches, but but it's just a, it's a certain in environment, right? It's a it's a bakery, and let's just say that that this certain bakery is not really heavy on Christian values or employees. So we're setting the stage for that. And and uh, Levi, we were having a conversation, and, and and Levi said the owner asked him, "Do you go to church?" And Levi told me he was ready to quit right there if the conversation went in a bad direction. And really, I think he was assuming that it was going to go in a bad direction, right? But instead of pulling the claws out and taking a defensive posture, Levi simply said, yes. Do you go to church? Yes, yes, I do. The owner went on to say, that must be why you're a nice young man and a hard worker. See, the world is watching. The world is watching. Sometimes they're watching known Christians because they want to see that Christian be a hypocrite. Right? We got we to gotta show them we're just as hypocritical as they are, but we love Jesus. Right, And sometimes the world is watching and they don't even know. See, he was watching Levi and it's like, man, he comes to work on time. He does a good job. He's got a good attitude. Something's different about him. I wonder what it is. Maybe he goes to church. I'm going to ask, do you go to church? Yes, I do. Oh, well, that makes sense. Right? And I think the same was happening or was, had the potential to happen way back during this ancient time that Paul was writing this letter. See, it goes way beyond. Hey, you know what you guys need to do? You guys need to take your Bible, the biggest Bible you can find, and go out and beat people over the head with it. Just beat them. Beat them to death with with your Bible and then try to scare them. Tell them, if you don't have Jesus, you're going to go to hell. You're going to live a life in hell, and it's going to be awful, and all your kids are going to be a mess. So you beat them with the Bible, and you try to scare them into the kingdom. That doesn't work. So Paul is coming back, and he's saying, hey, wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, treat your wives right. Treat them good. Kids, Obey your parents. Fathers, don't, don't come at your kids and, and favor one and, and dishonor the other and, and don't provoke them in anything but, but build them up. And, and now it gets to slaves. Slaves, obey your owners and work hard. Work to the glory of the Lord. And Paul's saying, you know what? I've seen it happen and it could happen here. It's going to change everything. It's going to change how society sees things. People are going to witness it. And the actions are going to speak much louder than the words. Can we just resolve right now to be a church of action as well as with words? When we're outside of church, when it's Tuesday afternoon and you're driving in traffic or you're at a store or anything, can, can the joy of the Lord just be present so people are saying, man, there's just something different about that person. Can we do that? Can we resolve to do that? Understanding that the world is watching. What will they see? Ask yourself that. What will they see? Like Paul's encouragement to the slaves, 
we do not merely do things to please people. Don't be a people-pleasing Christian, because that always ends badly. But rather with sincerity of heart, because of the fear, or, or we, could, we understand that that word is not an afraid fear, but it's a respect fear. We do it out of the respect of the Lord, right? We do these things. Let's continue with verse 23 and 24. Whatever you do, whatever your task may be, work from the soul that is put in your very best effort as something done for the Lord and not for men, knowing with all certain certainty that it is from the Lord, not from men, that you will receive the inheritance, inheritance which is yours, your greatest reward. It is the Lord Christ whom you actually serve. Amen. This verse directly ties back and reinforces verse 17, whatever you do, no matter what it is, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus in and in dependence on him, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Those are, you know, he kind of sandwiched a lot between those things. But, but, the, but the understanding is, is that, man, when you do things, you're not doing them just to do them. You're not doing them just to get a paycheck. You're not doing them just to please people. You're doing them as a representation to the Lord. And you're doing them in honor to the Lord. Everything? Yeah, kind of everything. Everything you do. So think about that. Think about the things you're doing and how you're doing them. Now, this is just my thoughts here. So I always preface that. These are my thoughts. So, so man, seek the word, pray about it, gain his wisdom. But this is, this is what I'm thinking is going on here. See, I believe that Paul purposefully addresses the slaves here, right here in the letter, in such a way to show that within the gospel, they are very much equals. How would it be being a slave back then? And you're starting to hear this stuff. And the Holy Spirit's working. And all of a sudden you're going, you know, though I may be in this position, in this society, at this time, I am very much an equal in the eyes of God. That everything that has been said leading up to this point, it's all relevant to the Christians, despite what stature in society that they may possess, and thereby the duties of the faithful believer in Christ pertain to all. The duties of the faithful believer in Christ pertain to all. That is still true today, wouldn't you agree? Amen. Now, though there are no legal slaves... The social and the economic status of, of America has in many ways established a hierarchy of human value. That's just the blunt reality right there. In our nation, the freest nation in the world, we have still created a hierarchy value of human life based on um, economics and society and, and uh, it trickles down to self-worth and, and all of those things. But I'm proud to say not in this church it hasn't. Though our houses and our cars and our clothes and our bank accounts and our accomplishes, they may look differently. In this church, we are all equal under the Lord. His saving grace, His hope, His love, His principles are not extended to only a few select, but rather to all. Amen? Verse 23 and 24 also remind slaves, or really anyone who is under authority, to offer their service <coughs> not to men, but unto the Lord. This allows us in any job, in any task, no matter how lowly we might think it is or, or what society has deemed it to be, we have the ability to have dignity and value within that, right? Because we're not being judged by man. 
we're doing it unto the Lord. So when the temptation comes to complain because what we have to do, remember the real reason that you're actually doing it. Now verse 25 is an interesting one that contrasts well with Ephesians 6. So uh, Colossians 3, 20, 25, For he who does wrong will be punished for his wrongdoing. And with God there is no partiality for no special treatment based on a person's position in life. There is, there is right and wrong by man's standards. And this mode of human justice, well, it has a lot of gray areas and can easily be adapted or even completely changed by cultural influences. You know, cultural evolution says that this is no longer wrong because we're going to deem it right or vice versa. Then there are God's standards of right and wrong. And those never change and have been set from eternity past because they are a direct reflection of God himself. Paul here takes an opportunity to re-emphasize these standards. Wrong is wrong, and there are definite consequences. Because of the, the preceding verses, because of where these verses lay in, in relation to what we have been reading, we can understand that, that this is a direct warning to slaves. Do the right thing. You'll be punished if you don't do the right thing. Slaves. Paul's addressing them directly. See, there will be no justification to wrongdoing based upon an unfortunate circumstance. Well, I was just in this circumstance and I had no choice, so I had to do these things. God's saying, that doesn't hold up. You do the right thing because you do the right thing, despite an unfortunate, unfortunate circumstance that you might be in. Now look at Ephesians when Paul's addressing the masters. And that there is no partiality with him, regardless of one's earthly status. So now he's addressing and, and he's saying the same thing to the masters. So we also see that there will be no justification of wrongdoing based upon, based upon an elevated status. We get both extremes right there. Oh, I had to do it because I had no choice, because people were, were holding me down, so I had to do it. Oh, I can do whatever I want because of my status and my bank account. We see both of those happening in our society today. In God's eyes, we are all equally loved as well as equally judged, regardless of any earthly standard. See, this principle right here should give us both hope as well as caution. Now let's take a look at how Paul addresses the masters. We're, we're into chapter 4. We're into chapter 4. Colossians 4.1, Masters, on your part, deal with your slaves justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. This is actually a, a, a huge verse. This is big. Because now, man, for Paul to be writing this letter and calling out the masters, addressing the masters during this time in this society, Again, this would have been controversial, but remember, he's addressing Christian masters who hopefully have an open heart and an open mind, a desire to learn. It's big, not because any of us in here are slave owners. At least I hope nobody in here is a slave owner. But rather, it's big for us because in our pride and in our arrogance, we can actually elevate ourselves while diminishing others in our life, right? We're not actually their master, but in our mind, we see ourselves better than they are. So we elevate ourselves somewhat like a master. So though in reality there is no master-slave relationship in our mind, we can degrade others to a position that's even lower than that of a slave. And be careful here. 
Be really careful here because society pushes us to do just this. Society wants to divide us. Society wants to form a hierarchy. Oh, you didn't go to college? Oh, you don't have your master's? Oh, you don't have your doctorate? Oh, you work there? Oh, you live there? Oh, you drive that? That means I'm better than you. That's what society pushes on us. That's what advertising is all about telling us that we need the newest and the greatest because in some way our social stature will increase. And God just shakes his head and says, guys, wake up. See, this is one of the most vile forms of division. And it's responsible for prejudice and bigotry and discrimination and racism. It's, it's all of those things, right? The gist of this verse is simple. To the masters, remember, these are the Christian masters. They are to do right by God. Not right by society's standards. Not necessarily right by their slaves' standards. They're to do right by God himself because they too have a master in heaven. So it doesn't matter how how far you climb the ladder in our society. Everyone is always and will always be under the master in heaven. So as a master, they still have duties. They still have obligations. But they must ask themselves on the basis of their belief in Christ, what is fair and what is right? Probably something that that we should be asking ourselves too. What is fair and what is right by God's standards? It is to God that the Christian masters are accountable. It is to God that each one of us are accountable. So the choice must be made. Does one live by society's standards or by God's standards? Peer pressure says you better live by society's standards. But Jesus' loving invitation simply says, come on over here. Come into relationship with me. Let me introduce God's standards to you. Let me introduce you to the fruit of the Spirit. Let me introduce you to God's order. Let me introduce you to hope and faith and love. And instead of somebody trying to force us into living up to a standard that we can never attain, Jesus dies for us so that we can live in his standard. It's a beautiful thing. So what do you think? What do you think? Is this passage of Scripture even relevant for us today? I think so. I think it definitely is. And I think it goes with last week's. And, and it should be read as, as, as one whole thought that, that, that Paul is conveying. It's very relevant. This entire passage, not only about slaves and masters that we looked at today, but even the greater passage, right, about husbands, wives, children, and fathers can be seen and even deemed as, as irrelevant by today's standards. And, and again, I'm talking to Christians here. Many Christians have deemed this passage of Scripture irrelevant. The world doesn't care, right? But as Christians, we have to. And we can try to, we can try to nitpick and point out all the reasons that this was only for them way back then. That only pertained to them specifically when Paul was writing to those faithful believers in the Colossian church. It's only good for them. And therefore, it doesn't have any value for me today. And on and on and on and blah, blah, blah. So many people try to disregard Scripture because they say, well, it's historical and that's what was happening then and it has no value for me today. And they go on living their life the way they keep living it. And it's not order and it's not hope and it's not love and it's not a good representation that Jesus has ever done anything in their life. 
See, it's important simply because overall it conveys God's enduring principles. Despite what our responsibilities are by a worldly standard, and we all got them, the world has placed responsibilities on each one of us, we ultimately have a master in heaven that we are to be working for, that we are to be living for. It is his value that we crave. It is his correction that we crave. It is his standard that we are to live by. Worship team, if you guys want to come up here. See, this in itself is what motivates us to give all our effort. It motivates us. We're to give all our effort to do what's right, to be faithful in our work. It doesn't matter what your work is. It doesn't matter how lowly others may think it is. It doesn't matter how elevated society says it is. No matter what that work is, we are to be faithful in that, doing it joyfully, with thankfulness, with gratitude, and with joy. Amen. How many times do we screw that up? A lot of the times, huh? Yeah, Glenn's pointing fingers again. It's going to be a long ride home, Glenn. You do this to yourself. But we do it all the time, don't we? Oh, if only, if only, if only I could get to this position. If only I had a job that paid more. If only, if only, if only. And we start doing things for the wrong reasons. And once we start doing things for the wrong reasons, we're not going to be doing them with a heart that, that conveys thankfulness, gratitude, and joy. And in the end, when working for the Lord, if we choose to truly work for the Lord, we can take pride in a job well done. And we can gain dignity even in those most underrated and underappreciated tasks. Amen? Amen. I, I truly appreciate this portion of Scripture. I really appreciate this text that we looked at today. And, and a lot of times when you hear a message with, with this portion of Scripture, it's, it's really at an angle where it's coming out. So bosses, treat your employees right. And employees, just work for your company. And, and that principle is true. But, but if we just focus on that, we can lose a lot. And forget the, the greater understanding that within our lives, it's so easy, it's easy for us to fall into that trap where I've, I've elevated certain people and I've degraded others. I've placed myself in my mind. I'm better than them. Therefore, I'm their master. And, and over here in my mind, I've placed myself under this person because, well, they're so good looking and they speak so well and, and, and they live here and their job is this. And, and God's saying, don't. Don't do it over here. And don't do it over here. Don't do it. I base my value in my creation. And I base it through the eyes of my son and the sacrifice that he made. So let's not make the mistake of falling into those traps, thinking we're better or thinking that we're worse. Because God sees us equal. He equally loves us. He equally warns us. And he will equally judge us. The determining factor is Jesus Christ himself. It determines our salvation. It determines our relationship with him. It determines our eternity. It doesn't mean we're better. It just means that we're submitted to the lordship of Jesus Christ. That's all that matters. Not your pay stub. Not the degree on your wall. Not your house. Not your bank account. God sees us equal. So maybe we need to look out into our community and close that gap. Either they know Jesus or they don't know Jesus. Period. Nothing else matters. Well, it makes me nervous to talk to homeless people. Well, it makes me nervous to talk to doctors. Not when you adopt the attitude. God has no partiality in that. 
either they know him or they don't. We're all in the even field here. We want to take as many people to heaven as possible. Amen? So let's do just that. We're going to finish with a little worship. We're going to go downstairs. We're going to enjoy each other. We're going to say, hey, this turkey casserole is equal to this turkey casserole. Because God sees no difference. Well, maybe he does a little bit in that. But we're just going to enjoy each other. We're going to bring the lights down. We're going to pray. Of course, we're going to open up these altars. Not anything specific, but if God's talking to you with anything this morning, maybe you're a little bit guilty of either elevating yourself too much or deflating yourself too much. Maybe you're guilty of taking those different attitudes. Maybe you're guilty of of not allowing your actions to line up with your words outside of a Sunday morning. If anything, if you're in any of those, just bring it to God. Lay it down before Him. He fixes things in, a, in an extraordinary and beautiful way. So let's just do that. If you just want to come up this morning to the altar and worship and bask in the glory of God, see what the Holy Spirit has for you. Hug on somebody, encourage somebody. Let's be that kind of church. Can we be that kind of church? Not just this morning, but every every morning, Sunday mornings, every afternoon, every evening. Now let's do this, that. Father, you, in your order, inspired Paul to write a letter to the faithful believers in the Colossian church, full well knowing that on the Sunday after Thanksgiving in Montana, USA, your scripture would be completely relevant and cause us to reevaluate our own lives. Lord, in your wisdom and in your order and in your love, you did all of those things for us right now. How much must you love each one of us? How much must you want to empower your church to make a difference? God, you're astounding. You're amazing. We can't comprehend these things. And yet, we are blessed by them. So Jesus, be glorified this morning. Holy Spirit, be glorified this morning. Father God, be glorified this morning. Lead us and teach us. Provoke us into action and give us those opportunities to add to your kingdom through both our words and our actions. Father, if we have fallen short and held in our minds a superior attitude or held in our minds a place where where we beat ourselves up, we self-condemn ourselves. Lord God, forgive us for those things. We repent of those things. And in, in that place, replace your glorious spirit, your glorious attributes, and your glorious attitude. Once again, Jesus, we are thankful for you. And we will always make it all about you. We pray this in your name, Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. This concludes today's message. We hope you can join us next Sunday for services beginning at 10 o'clock a.m. at Bridge Assembly located at 725 Granite Avenue in Helena, Montana. For more information about Bridge Assembly, go to bridgehelena.com. And we hope you can join us next Sunday with Pastor Jason Metz.